Now I have honor to present Anne Orvik, who is professor in cultural history at the Department of Cultural Studies and Oriental Languages at the University of Oslo. She has particularly been interested in the, such topics as our books and manuscript history, witchcraft and magic, ritual and tradition, history of medicine and heritage studies by studying both early modern and comp contemporary material from the Nordic countries and beyond. Please. Thank you so much for that presentation. Just, uh, and uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for the invitation to come here. My first time in uh, Ljubljana. And um, as uh, I am not uh, one of the members of the Intavia uh, project, um, I'm slightly uh, anxious as to whether I will, you know, fit <laughs> this group uh, or not. Um, so I should basically start with um, a small disclaimer. I'm not a biographer <laughs> as such. I am first and foremost uh, a cultural historian uh, interested in the historical formation of knowledge. So, this interest has, obviously, led me to the study of several individuals uh, central in the formation of early modern uh, history of knowledge. And it is in this context, uh, context and the construction and use of uh, biography has been crucial tools and sources to the understanding of knowledge interpretation, knowledge production, dissemination, and so forth. However, as a cultural historian with a background in folklore studies, I do have my training in the genres such as autobiography, memories, rumors, legends, fairy tales, and other oral narrative traditions. Uh, genres uh, directing us towards the everyday life of individuals and groups, of their worldviews, desires, and aspirations that enable us to better understand our history. The topic of this paper is the Norwegian legend and fairy tale collector and scientist Peter Christen Aspjensen. Through the study of, among other sources, a vast collection of letters that he received we get a glimpse of Aspjensen as an impressive cultural networker in the 19th century Norway and Europe. Consisting of artists, authors, academics, politicians, publishers and the like, this network came to influence and shape Aspjensen's engagement with folklore collecting as well as his work with the natural sciences. Through the study of the life and work of Aspjensen, we may gain important insight into the knowledge production, the dissemination, the interpretation and development in a very crucial time for the development of the sciences. Uh, the prof uh, professionalization of academia and the formation of national states. So, this paper 
will focus on the evolution and nature of his network and view it as a specific form of knowledge community. By studying a bulk of letters that Asbjörnsson received during his lifetime, it is possible to reconstruct his life, passions, and interests. As such, his communications help us to understand his role as a cultural conduct at the heart of the national romantic period in Norway in the 19th century. His biography reflects the history of Norway as an emerging independent nation, um, not yet there, but still, uh, the development of different sciences and how knowledge was distributed through networks in the 19th century. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so, this is Peter Christian Aspernsen. And he lived between 1812 and 1885. And he ended up being the most influential Norwegian folklore collector and publisher in the 19th century. He started his folklore collecting in his youth and continued throughout his life with collecting and publishing folk traditions. His first publications came with the four volume of Norwegian folk tales between 1841 and 1844. And from this time on, Asbjörnsen would publish a number of collections and editions, later also illustrated by Norwegian artists, primarily in the Norwegian narrative tradition of folk tales and legends. Nearly 150 years after his passing, he is still the major and iconic reference to Norwegian fairy tales and legends in Norway, still having his narratives published and retold to new generations. Asbjörnsen was, however, interested in a wide range of topics. While he received his formal education within natural science and forestry in Tarant in Germany, he was engaged in a number of different fields. He wrote articles uh, on subjects uh, as diverse as economics, nutrition, forestry, forestry, forestry sorry, the cultivation of marshes and handicrafts, even publishing a cookbook at one point. Asbjörnsen would also become the first Norwegian to disseminate the evolu evolutionist's idea proposed by Charles Darwin in his On the Origin of Species from 1859. Asbjörnsen was extremely productive, had a generally inquisitive outset and had a drive for exploring and learning, something his constant growing network testifies to. And it is his nourishing uh, of his intellectual network that is the main focus here. So Ospjernsen's network was a knowledge network resembling in several ways that which has been coined the Republic of Letters from the early modern period. Anthony Crafton labels this uh, self-proclaimed metaphysical community of scholars and intellectuals in early modern Europe that exchange knowledge, viewpoints and perspectives primarily through writing letters as a republic with, and I quote, no borders, no government, 
and no capital, end of quote. Modernity is seen as the threshold from which this republic came under pressure from nationalism and later from various forms of intellectual specializations. Indeed, the nature of the knowledge that characterized the Republic of Letters during the early modern period had been based essentially on ideas relating to imperial, linguistic, and political hegemony. However, the production and exchange of knowledge did not stop, obviously, in the 19th century. It was the focus of the knowledge that shifted. So, to offer you just uh, a slight context to uh, my particular study, this, this study is a part of an ongoing research of early modern and modern history of knowledge. More particularly, uh, the formation and development of folklore studies in the 19th century with the brothers uh, Jakob and William Grimm uh, in Germany as central navigation points and inspirations. Characterized in this recent book from um, 2022 as Grimm Ripples. So uh, this book um, examines the life and work of several major folklore collectors in Northern Europe and how they were influenced by the Grimm brothers uh, and secondly offers insight into the key role played by folklore collectors in the romantic nationalistic movement of the early 19th century. Um, another context, uh, and maybe probably also uh, one of the results as uh, this far uh, uh, from the Grim Ripples project, um, um, and the Grim Ripples research into the lives of Central European intellectuals during the 19th century, has been its contribution to the large online database called Encyclopedia of Romantic Nationalism in Europe, which you might be familiar with. Uh, one of the strengths of uh, this database is how it cross-references biographies with materials, themes and topics, uh, bibliographies, and so much more so that individual lives becomes part of groups, movements, networks, geographies, and cultures, thus making sense in particular ways to the cultural contributions of our northern folklorists. They were a republic of letters in their own rights, and I will get back to that database uh, in a little while, if we can make it work. So, so what type of republic um, do we find in the 19th century? Well, the focus of the knowledge swift shifted, as um, I mentioned. Now it was driven by new ideas and preconditions as new subjects were discovered and developed and new groups and networks formed. These new ideas dominated by a nationalized cultural consciousness as has been very well documented in works by, for instance, the Dutch uh, Joop Lersen, for instance, 
We're also directly and indirectly the motivation among those the Norwegian Peter Christen Aspernsen communicated with. Ideas were being exchanged by artists and intellectuals at a time when central concepts such as folk and nation were still under construction and subject to various forms of interpretation. These interpretations would go on to have a significant political and cultural impact on the process of nation building that took place in Northern Europe during the early and mid 19th century. So the grim communications, as we see an example of here, are in many ways a synthesis of Aspjornsson's networking. Through letters, they exchange greetings and pass on greetings from others. Vouch for people who will seek them up or are in need of patrons. Exchange book and articles written both by themselves and others. Exchange, exchange thoughts and reflections on different publications and, of course, also discuss theories relating to the folklore material. The Grimsar, however, included in a very impressive network that Aspernsen built throughout his life and which comprised uh, approximately 500 individuals and institutions. And as you can see here, I've tried to kind of divide these uh, people into two different groups to, to kind of show um, and to show how uh, this network reflect uh, Aspernsen's a diverse, um, polymathic approach to knowledge and how it includes a great variety of, of, uh, of illustrators, authors, publishers, historians, uh, philologists, and so on. Um, it illustrates the bulk of letters that for the most part are part of the Norwegian folklore archive and represents letters received. So my method then, uh, when studying Aspjornsson uh, uh, and his letters uh, of some 1,600 uh, uh, letters is to a large extent not his own writing but that done by others. Approximately 30% of the letters come from Norwegian contacts uh, and leaves an impressive 70% uh, of the network uh, communication being made up uh, of contacts abroad. Um, but, Yeah, and here you can actually also see the, the number of letters broken down into periods as to indicate and to illustrate uh, when um, uh, perhaps <laughs> uh, Ospjernsen would have been the most active in his uh, networking based on the letters we do have. And as you can see, this indicates that his most intensive networking year was 1859 while residing in Tarant uh, in Germany and in the period between 1872 and 1884. Uh, even though we know these number only partially give us an indication of his activities, the number still gives us insight into you know, how he did his networking. However, um, when contrasting, contrasting the letters uh, with an additional source 
we see that sources, we see what sources we miss. Because Asbjörnsen, he was a quite meticulous scholar. And one of the things he did was actually to keep a notebook, at least for parts of his life, uh, where he kept records of everyone he wrote and received letters from. And these notebooks provide an indication of the discre discrepan discrepancy between the number of letters that are currently available to us, at least in the archive, and the actual number of letters written and received by Asbjörnsen. So, we can see that the letters we do have for the years 1877 and 1883 only covers roughly 27% of the actual number of letters received and written by Asbjörnsen. So his networking was extensive. Okay. Enough of the counting for now. What did these scholars write about? Uh, the topics addressed in the letters can roughly be divided into two main categories. The first category relates to the more practical side of networking, such as making arrangements for physical meetings at home and abroad, recommendations being requested for colleagues and friends or for the letter writers themselves and the exchange of tokens related to genuine interests or ambition, such as personal portraits, exemplified here, uh, diverse transactions regarding publications, drafts of agreements for publications, sketches for illustrations uh, in planned publications, and formal invitations regarding the membership of scientific societies. The portraits are in many ways an interesting study in themselves and worth looking into, I think, as studies of self-presentation. Here, I will give you just some glimpses of how 19th century scholars in folklore and related disciplines chose to present themselves. Um, from the left, we have Gustav Klemming, a Swedish librarian. Then we have in the middle, August Alquist in Finland, who became a, pro a professor in Finnish language and literature at Helsinki University. Um, and to the right, the quite famous Dane Sven Grundtvig from 1875, uh, also a publisher of folk narratives. Mm. The second category of topics in the letters relate more directly to general exchange of knowledge, including the physical exchange of books and magazines, the dissemination of knowledge by means of lectures and books, and the di distribution of knowledge between people and geographies. There's a reception of knowledge and ideas, and not least, discussions on the nature of knowledge and how it may develop. And this also, of course, includes developing theories within the study of folklore. Uh, here we have um, three Germans. It's uh, Konrad uh, Maurer. Yeah, <laughs> uh, on uh, the, uh, the right there, uh, uh, Professor Felix Liebricht and Dr. Reinhold Bechstein aus Meiningen from Leipzig. Yes, okay, I'm moving swiftly now to uh, close my, uh, my talk here now. Um, linking the work of the Grim Ripples with the online 
uh, database of the romantic nationalism in Europe and making other tangible objects and sources of Ospensen available and linked adds to a more nuanced, complex and multi-layered history of both Asbjörnsson and his network. So basically, uh, I think this is just uh, for you to, uh, to visit and to, to actually try to search the search engine if, if uh, you find it uh, interesting. Um, uh, and also, if we go to the next one here. Yeah. Uh, yes. Because the question is, uh, the fruits of my study of Aspjörnsen and his uh, letters, uh, what have they been so far? Okay. So, when visiting this um, website, and for instance, looking at uh, uh, letters, uh, and here from the outset of, of, um, of, uh, oh, <laughs> of the Grimms, just uh, to show you the, the multitude, uh, they can add a lot to the understanding of how these networks worked. Uh, we can understand the production of knowledge uh, and the fact that it did not come to a halt, of course, in the 19th century, yet the focus of this knowledge shifted. As Peter Burke has noted in connection with the Republic of Letters, while the active exchange of knowledge, viewpoints and perspectives did not undergo any fundamental change on the threshold to modernity, the way in which this material traveled certainly did. Um, and so, <laughs> yes, the last one. Yes, and it's just the slide. Good. So, it was driven by new ideas and preconditions as new subjects were discovered and developed and new groups and networks formed. These new ideas dominated by a nationalized cultural consciousness were also directly and indirectly the motivation among those Ospjörnsen communicated with, like the Grimms, whose communications are the focal point in the last one and this one here. As you can see, the Kassel, the city of Kassel is uh, the outset here. Ideas were being exchanged by artists and intellectuals at a time when central concepts such as folk and nation were still under construction and subject to various forms of interpretations. These interpretations would go on to have a significant, significant political and cultural impact on the process of nation building that took place in Northern Europe during the early and mid 19th century. Thank you. <laughs>